everyone and welcome back. My name is Moose and this is Moose Henderson Photography. Today we're going to go ahead and present a wildlife presentation. Now usually I do these presentations at schools such as universities and at various clubs and stuff. These presentations are somewhat long so you'll want to pause this video, go get a box of popcorn and your favorite drink and then sit back and relax in order to watch the presentation. This will include a number of photographs that I have done over the years, a couple of stories, and uh, you know, maybe even an anecdote here and there. Hello everyone, and welcome to the wildlife presentation. Typically I would do these presentations for universities, colleges, camera clubs, and so on and someone of some importance would stand up here and introduce me. And while they were doing it, they would be facing the audience and I would be behind them. And of course the screen would be behind them. And while they were introducing me, I would usually show this slide because I'm not very much for a bunch of accolades. Accolades, how do you say that? I guess accolades. And so as soon as they would start to go into me having a PhD and all the contests I've won and so on and so on, I would show this slide. Some of the audience would start laughing. They'd turn around and I'd quickly switch slides. And so they would have no idea why we were laughing. But nonetheless, I welcome you all here and I hope that you enjoy watching the program. It's going to be somewhat long, so I encourage you to sit back in your easy chair, and hopefully you have your remote in your hand. I hope you have some food to eat, such as some popcorn or a couple cookies and snacks, maybe even some frog legs or some venison. At the end of the program, there'll be plenty of time to ask any questions. So if you have any, since this is a recorded program, go ahead and put them down in the comments section and I'll be glad to answer them. Well, many, many years ago, I used to own my own laboratory. I did various types of forensic work and I also did various types of identification of hazardous waste. And I primarily used microscopes and these are some of the microscopes that I had in my laboratory. There was a number of other microscopes, and as Jimmy Buffett said, I made enough money to buy Miami, but I pissed it all away. Well, I didn't exactly piss it all away. We helped out a lot of homeless people. We sent five children through school. We had a number of big houses and fancy cars and so on. I guess we pissed it all away. During that time, I owned a sailboat, and this is an example of one of the sailboats I owned. This is a Tiana 37. This was the largest of the sailboats that I owned. Usually, the sailboats I would own would be more in the 30-foot range, such as a Golden Hind 32 or a West Sail 31. I enjoyed living aboard the sailboat, and I lived aboard for 11 years. A sailboat, of course, is a relatively small space, but it still suited me quite well. When I went off to the university to work on my graduate degree, I needed a place to live. I didn't really want to live in a dormitory and things like that, so I built myself a 20-foot tiny house, which you can see here. I went to school up north where snow levels were fairly deep. We got in excess of 300 inches of snow per year, so shoveling snow was not an unusual occurrence. During the time that I was living in this 20-foot tiny house, I needed to do some research, and I went to the Tetons, and I took the tiny house with me. And while I was in the Tetons, the place where I parked it, the landowner offered to buy it. So I went ahead and sold this particular tiny house to the landowner in the Tetons. This particular tiny house was known as Moose Villa. When I came back to the university, I needed a place to live. So I built another tiny house. And this one was four feet longer. And this was, of course, known as Moose Villa Two. I lived in this tiny house for a few years, and it also went to the Tetons. It also went back to the Upper Peninsula a few times, and after about five or six years, I finally sold it. 
After selling it, I built a very small tiny house, what can also be known as a gypsy wagon or a Varda, named after the people in Romania who used to travel around in these types of structures. And I used this particular structure during COVID to write a book about the wildlife of Florida. And I put about 13,000 miles on this little Bardo trailer. Now, this thing is roughly six foot wide and eight foot long, and it includes a shower, a desk, uh, a bedroom, well, actually a bed, not a bedroom, and a little kitchen. There's videos on my YouTube channel that show the inside of this, and you're welcome to go watch those. Speaking about books I've written, I get a bit carried away. I'm a bit of an overachiever, so when I write a book, I tend to do more than just one, and three of my books are scientific books about microhistology, and that's the first three books on the top row from the left. And then I've written a few books about various aspects of photography. And you can see that there's some of those books called the 50 Wildlife Hotspots. The, those two books are relatively popular, and the other books are available on Amazon as downloads if you'd like to uh, order any of those. And I think they're relatively cheap. After I moved out of the little Bardo trailer, I moved back into my tiny house, what was known as Moose Villa 2, and I had that on a piece of property up in the Upper Peninsula. And after a few years, I decided with some of the pending issues I was having medically that I wanted to travel. So I purchased a Casita trailer, which is a 14-foot fiberglass trailer. And I really love this little fiberglass trailer, and I've traveled extensively in it, and I still have it. And this is the trailer up near the glacier up in Canada. And I was just up in Canada for a couple of months this past October. I frequently have a question, how do I get close to wildlife? Well, sometimes the wildlife gets close to me. As you can see in this picture, I'm sitting next to the shore in Alaska, right next to the town of Homer, Alaska. And this young bald eagle decided to come up and investigate what I was doing. Typically, wildlife is not quite that accustomed to me, and I have to get close to it by using a photographic blind, or actually a hunting blind. This is just a cheap hunting blind, what is known as a doghouse. There's a number of companies who make these, and I've gone through quite a few of them, but they serve their purpose very well. I sit on the inside of the blind along with my tripod, my camera, my flash unit. I use any type of chair that I can scrounge up. And sometimes I'll spend 8 to 12 hours a day inside the blind trying to take pictures of wildlife. I started my journey of wildlife photography in Florida back in 2004. And Florida is pretty well known for habituated birds. You see them pretty much everywhere, and they're pretty much used to humans. So you can get pretty good pictures of them. Of course, there's also flying birds, such as osprey, cattle egrets, and birds is not the only thing we have in Florida. We also have alligators. And there are a few mammals, like the key deer that you find down in the Florida Keys. After a long period of being in Florida, I got the itch to travel a bit, and one of the first places that I went to is a place known as Bosque del Apache, which is in New Mexico, south of Albuquerque. And this is a place that is quite well known for sandhill cranes and snow geese from roughly the month of October through to the early spring sandhill cranes and snow geese over winter at Bosque del Apache, and the scenery is just unbelievable down there with beautiful sunsets and awesome sunrises, plus all of these birds. In addition to Bosque del Apache, I also took a trip up to Alaska to photograph the eagles, 
And the place that I stopped to do this was in Homer, Alaska, which was pretty well known as an excellent place to photograph bald eagles. And you can see here that we've got the eagles flying over the bay. Some of the pictures, the bay had a bit of ice in it, and other pictures, the ice was clear. It's a lot of fun to be able to photograph the eagles as they come down to snatch a fish directly out of the water, and I certainly enjoyed that. During one of the lunch breaks, some friends and I went and sat in a local diner, and we were sitting there, and along the road walks a moose, a cow moose. I assume the moose was coming into town to get a chiropractic adjustment, as the chiropractor is right across the street. I, of course, had studied moose in the past, but I had never actually met one. So this was extremely exciting for me. I ran outside and kind of ran after the moose and chased it down and took a few photos of it. And it was a lot of fun. And that kind of started my intense love affair with moose. Well, moose aren't the only big animals that I have been photographing. I've also photographed bighorn sheep such as this bighorn sheep in the Badlands, and also North American elk. And the North American elk are quite plentiful in the area of the Tetons up into Yellowstone and so on. And I spent a couple of years living in what is known as the Yellowstone ecosystem, which includes, of course, Yellowstone National Park, Grand Teton National Park, the John D. Rockefeller Parkway, and a number of other areas. While living there, I photographed elk and other animals extensively, and on occasion, I also traveled up to Canada, such as this particular elk up on top of the hill. I not only like photographing big animals, I like photographing smaller animals also, such as this bobcat, that is standing in a little patch of snow, and it was a lot of fun when she stood up to get a stretch or to walk in the deep snow. You can see how deep the snow is here. She's all the way up to her belly. I also like photographing larger cats. This, of course, is a mountain lion or a cougar, and this particular cat was right outside of Yosemite National Park in California in a little town known as Mariposa. Going down to a little bit smaller animals, I also love photographing them, and this is a yellow-bellied marmot, and this is a black-tailed prairie dog. And you may be saying, well, that's not so small. Those are the size of pussycats. Have you photographed any mammals that are really small? Well, yes, I have. I have photographed the least chipmunk, which can easily fit into your hand, and you hardly even know it's there. Of course, some animals aren't as tame and docile as the least chipmunk. There's also the American badger, which can be a bit fierce. And I have an interesting story to share with you about the American badger. The first time I was able to photograph one was during the winter, and a gentleman went out with me to be able to take photographs, and he stood behind me with a shovel to kind of protect me in case the badger decided to come after me, because you need to get down low to photograph a badger, because they're not very high off the ground. And while I was trying to photograph the badger, and he was turning to the left and turning to the right, and basically not paying attention to me at all, the guy behind me with his shovel grabbed a load of snow and threw it onto the face of the badger, as you see here. Having snow thrown on his face didn't make the badger very happy, and of course it didn't make me very happy either, as the badger decided to face directly towards us, but I did manage to get a picture before I jumped up off the ground and had somewhat of a conversation with this man that threw the snow. Even though I traveled a bit, I always seemed to be coming back to the state of Florida since that's where I had my laboratory and that's where I had my home. And I was still working in the laboratory 
So a lot of the pictures that I would take were in and around Florida. And there's a lot of shorebirds and wading birds, such as great blue herons, pelicans, and so on. Of course, birds are also located in other areas, and when I was in some of these areas, I would on occasion photograph these birds, such as this golden eye, or this swan, or this owl, which I particularly love. In addition to animals that are common, I also have a real passion for endangered species. And so anytime I get an opportunity to photograph and document an endangered species, I take that opportunity. And here we have a Florida scrub jay, or this is known as a leucistic chipmunk. Of course, the whooping crane, the endangered Delmarva ground squirrel, and of course, the elusive mountain lion that I was able to photograph in the Tetons. And there is a video about this also. It was a really exciting time. I was able to photograph this animal in the wild. And that pile of sticks you see there is an elk that the mountain lion had taken down and covered up. And it's sitting there protecting its food cache. I also took a trip to California and was able to photograph some of the marine life in California, including the sea lions and the endangered elephant seals. Those are so beautiful and so awesome to be able to witness. And back in Florida, of course, photographing the endangered key deer that's located down in Big Pine Key. And then there is the endangered black-footed ferret. Did you know at one time the black-footed ferret was listed as extinct for about 10 or 12 years? But then a dog in the state of Wyoming dragged home a dead animal. And the owners on the ranch didn't know what it was, so they took this dead animal to a taxidermist. The taxidermist was somewhat of an outdoorsy type person, and he knew immediately that this was a black-footed ferret. So he called the DNR, and they came and investigated. And this was the rebirth of the black-footed ferret, which had been thought to be completely extinct. They found a couple areas where these ferrets were. They captured them. They did a rebirthing program and a re-release. And now these black-footed ferrets are doing quite well in areas such as Wyoming, South Dakota, North Dakota, up in Montana, and so on. Oops, I didn't mean to show you that. Two birds having a little bit more fun than I am today. Well, you know, I'm a wildlife photographer. When I go to the Grand Canyon, and instead of photographing the majesty of the Grand Canyon, I'm photographing a bird. Such is the life of someone who loves wildlife. Of course, this is a northern cardinal, and I photographed this up in North Carolina. And this is a common pigeon, like you would see in any city and stuff. But this just goes to show if you put something in an attractive background, that even something like a common pigeon can look really attractive. This pigeon was during my two years in Siberia. Yes, Siberia, Russia. I spent two years photographing wildlife in Siberia, Russia, once during the year of 2007 and the second time during the year of 2010. And I photographed a number of birds and a couple of mammals while I was there. And during the time that I was there, I was in a city known as Egypt, which is right on the Ural Mountains. It's on the western side of, of Russia. And I was in the middle of the city and photographing a couple of birds in a city park. And this is the bird that I was photographing. It's known as a jackdaw. 
and I had my long lens and my camera and a big tripod and things such as that. And while I was photographing this jack doll in the middle of the city park, three army vehicles come pulling up and out scurries a bunch of Russian soldiers. And of course, out of the driver's seat jumps a couple of officers and they come and they pick up my camera and they pick me up and kind of throw me into the back of the truck and take me down for interrogation. Of course, they were firing questions at me left and right, and all of these questions were in Russian, and I don't understand Russian all that well, maybe 50 to 100 words. So I just kind of sat there and said, I don't understand. Of course, I said that in Russian, not in uh, American, which in Russian is Yanni Penimaya. And I just keep repeating that over and over again. And I was in this room with kind of a spotlight, the standard Gestapo type of techniques with a big Russian guy on one side of the desk and me sitting in a chair on the other and him firing questions at me. And after two or three hours of him asking questions, finally, he called the embassy and got an interpreter sent over. Well, the interpreter was a young lady that had just graduated from the university. Of course, she was attractive, like a lot of the Russian ladies are. And then this guy started firing questions at me again, and she translated them into English. And it turns out this gentleman wanted to know, why was I photographing the building? Well, of course, I wasn't photographing the building. I was photographing a bird. But, of course, I was in the middle of town, so there were probably buildings all around me. So he kept asking, well, why are you photographing the building? And then I explained to the young lady who could translate that I was photographing birds. And if she would let me see my camera, it's a digital camera, and I can show them the birds on the back of the screen of the camera. So they brought my camera to me. And I showed them the pictures on the back of the screen, and they finally satisfied themselves that, you know, I was not a spy or something like that, and they finally allowed me to go, of course, along with my camera equipment. It turns out the building that was across the street is a munitions factory that makes AK-47s and other types of Russian weapons. And it's right there in the middle of town, in the town of Izhevsk. So always be careful when you're a foreigner and you're in a country like Russia. Things can get exciting. So I continued my time in Russia and photographing lots of birds, both large and small. This is a great tit. And of course, I love photographing, I'll just say birds, not the name of this bird again. And of course, woodpeckers. And more tits. This is a coal tit. And this is a nuthatch. And of course, this is an owl. This is known as a Ural owl. And this was another one of those stories that has uh, kind of a funny ending. I was photographing this Ural owl, and he was, I don't know, about 10 meters off the ground, you know, roughly 30 feet. And I was standing on the ground, and of course, in Siberia. It's bitter cold, so I had on one of those fur hats, like you see the Russians always wear, you know, the fur hats that are made out of fox, and I had it pulled down on my head fairly well, because I think this day was minus 25, minus 30, and eventually this owl got curious enough about what I was doing wearing a fox on my head, or at least something that looked like a fox. So uh, he or she came flying out of the tree with his talons outstretched and grabbed the hat. Of course, in grabbing the hat, also grabbed the skin of my scalp in six different places and scraped a pretty good opening on the top of my head and then ran off with my f fur hat. So the moral of that story is don't photograph owls while wearing a fur hat. This is what is known as a Siberian tiger here in North America. In Russia, it's known as an Amur tiger because it originally was in the Amur province and it's now located uh, over in the Primorsky region. But at one time, it covered much of the Amur province and also much of the Primorsky region. 
course, now it is an extremely endangered animal. I also had the opportunity in Russia to photograph some smaller animals like the Siberian chipmunk. And we had a very short summer in Siberia, which consisted of maybe two and a half months. And during that two and a half months, the insects were so thick, it looked like you were wearing black pants when they landed on you. But of course, since I'm a photographer, I photograph insects, and these were the friendly ones. There were also ones that weren't so friendly, such as this guy. But, you know, you do what you got to do to get some more pictures. Once I came back to the United States, I was continuing my schooling and also spending a fair amount of time in the Yellowstone ecosystem, photographing animals there. This is a pronghorn. This is a male pronghorn, in fact. You can tell by the black patch on the side of his face, on either side of his face. And this is an American pika, which is an animal that has a very narrow a niche and stuff. And so it's kind of an indicator of climate change because it can only live in a very selective environment. I also had the opportunity to photograph some porcupines and also some bunny rabbits, such as his mountain cottontail up in, up in Yellowstone. And this is an eastern cottontail that I photographed while I was over in Minnesota, and a silver fox, and a jumping arctic fox. This is one of the images that won first place in a national contest. And you can probably see why it has some dynamic, uh, it's kind of a dynamic image. This little animal is one that very few people have probably ever been exposed to. It is known as a fisher, and it looks a little bit like a bear, like a bear in miniature. This is probably, I don't know, 10, 14 inches tall. So it's really a cute animal, but it is a predator, and it's a pretty fierce predator, and it will go after uh, game animals that are at least twice its size. This is a prairie dog that I was photographing in Custer State Park, which is located in southwest South Dakota. And this is another predator known as a pine marten, which is found uh, pretty extensively in evergreen trees, such as conifers. This, of course, is a wolverine, another animal that uh, kind of needs an attitude adjustment. They always seem to be upset. And this is a female bighorn sheep and a coyote. And this was an interesting photo. I was up in Yellowstone during the winter, the month of February, and during the month of February in Yellowstone, the snow is especially deep off the side of the road, but the road that goes from the north entrance to the north eastern entrance is kept plowed because that's the only entrance and exit for Cook City and Silver City. Well, since they plow the road, then the snow is not very deep on the road. And I was parked on the road, and this coyote comes walking right up to me. I had to change to a wide-angle lens just to get this photograph at point-blank range. Of course, these are the Tetons, and I call images like this animal scapes. Instead of landscapes, I have the central portion of the photograph be an animal, and then the landscape is kind of the background. I really enjoy taking images like this. And this is another bison out for a stroll on the road, and occasionally it's cold enough outside and frosty enough that we have hoarfrost. And this was an image that I had in mind for many, many years, and I finally had an opportunity to capture it, a bison portrait covered in hoarfrost. Another one of the animals that I really like are mountain goats, and they can take on somewhat of a dirty appearance during some parts of the year, but during other parts of the year, they look 
almost pristine. And this particular guy really looked nice and beautiful standing on this rock. It's amazing how they can go up and down a rock face that I wouldn't be able to climb in 10 years. And they scamper up and down it in seconds. Of course, also in the Yellowstone ecosystem, there's a number of bears, such as black bears, or this one that's almost a cinnamon bear, kind of a brownish black bear. And this, of course, is a real black bear. It's almost jet black. And in addition to black bears, we have brown bears, or what we know as grizzly bears, such as this guy out here in the middle of the flowers. And occasionally, they'll still be out and around when it starts to snow in October, as you see right here. Now, the bears do go into hibernation during late October, but if you're out there and you're, and you're vigilant enough, occasionally you'll catch them in the deep snow. Now, this particular bear came up to drink right out of the puddle right next to the passenger side of my car. So if I had wanted to, I could have rolled down the window of the passenger side and reached out and pet this bear. But I kind of resisted. I didn't think petting the bear was a good idea that day. Well, as much as I love all these other animals, my number one passion is moose. And I love photographing moose in all of their different orientations and all of their different seasons of the year, such as this moose during the early fall in the state of Utah, or this moose during the summer in the Tetons, as is this moose, or this moose up in Canada. So yeah, I have photographed moose from all over the place. And you may be wondering, well, since moose lose their antlers during the winter, how do you tell a cow moose from a bull moose? Because, of course, there's no antlers. Well, actually, that is pretty easy. If you look right between the tail of a moose when he turns his backside to him, like you see here, if you see a white patch like you see on this particular moose, then it's a female. This white patch is known as a vulva patch. And bull moose, like you see here, do not have a vulva patch because, of course, they don't have one of those. So on with a couple more photographs of the moose that I have taken from all over the northern parts of the United States, even ones during sunrise or sunset with the mountains in the background. During the fall, this particular image is what is known as the Flamen response or Fleshman response, depending on how you pronounce that word. What is happening here is the bull moose has an organ in the top of his mouth known as a Jacobson organ. And that particular organ is there to smell the pheromones of the female moose. And so they tilt their head back to open a flap and inhale across that particular organ to see if the female moose are ready to be mated with. And also moose during autumn, such as this bull moose, or moose during winter, such as this guy, or even a younger moose. So that pretty much concludes our program for today. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll close out the program with this particular image. This is one of my favorite images of moose located up in Jasper National Park in Alberta, Canada. I thank you for joining us today. I hope you have enjoyed the program. If you would, I have a YouTube channel known as Moose Henderson Photography, and if you'd like to follow my adventures and to see a lot more of my images, please go ahead and sign in to that YouTube channel, subscribe to our channel, and I look forward to presenting more of my work to you as time goes on. I thank you so much for your time, your consideration, and, and your politeness. Please, if you have any questions or comments, leave them down in the show notes section, and I'll be delighted to answer them. Thank you so much. Goodbye.
Presentations at schools such as universities and at various clubs and stuff. These presentations are somewhat long, so you'll want to pause this video, go get a box of popcorn and your favorite drink, and then sit back and relax in order to watch the presentation. This will include a number of photographs that I have done over the years, a couple of stories, and uh, you know, maybe even an anecdote here and there.